Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Panwin Yoking. I am a fellow at the East West Center, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here moderating today's session. To those who are new to the event, welcome to EWC Insights, Asia Pacific Political Transitions. To those who have attended our past session, welcome back and thank you for joining us again. Our sessions this afternoon features a presentation from Dr. Pittman Potter. Dr. Potter is a visiting fellow at the ISWA Center and Emeritus Professor of Law at the University of British Columbia. His teaching and research have focused on PRC and Taiwan law and policy in the areas of international trade and investment, dispute resolution, property and contract law, business regulation, as well as human rights. He has published many books and essays on China law and policy, including Export Virtue, China's International Human Rights Activism in the Age of Xi Jinping. Prior to his retirement in 2020, Dr. Potter served as an attorney licensed in British Columbia Washington State and California handling China business and arbitration matters. Dr. Potter has served on the board of directors of several public institutions, including the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. He is a deacon in the Anglican Church of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. In his talk today, he will be focusing on China's policies and actions on COVID-19 and climate change and suggest how the US and others might respond. And before we get started, just a brief note on the session's logistics. Dr. Potter's presentation will be approximately 40 minutes long. Then we will transition to a 20 minute Q&A session. And I encourage all attendees to share your questions and comments in the Q&A box. And we will try our best to get through as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. And lastly, I would like to also make an, a quick announcement that the next speaker of this series on Asia Pacific political transitions will be Laura Solman, and her talk will be on December 15th at 2 p.m. And without further ado, I will now hand this over to Dr. Potter to start his presentation. Uh, good afternoon. It's my uh, great pleasure to join you today. I'd like to just thank initially uh, the East West Center for inviting me to do this talk, uh, particularly uh, Jeff Fox and uh, Danny Roy, and also the East West Center staff who are, I can't name them all, but certainly uh, Mary Ching, uh, Carolyn Aguchi, and Padwen Yuking. I'd uh, appreciate all of your efforts on this uh, project today. So without further ado, I will just start through my uh, slides. So uh, this project is actually part of uh, this talk today is part of a larger project in which I'm examining uh, China's behavior as a uh, populist regime uh, uh, in the term of global populism. Uh, and we've seen China uh, move from uh, an ethos of serving the people to an ethos of common prosperity. And those both uh, suggest uh, uh, themes of populism, uh, both a progressive populism that looks to an idealized future and a regressive populism that looks to an idealized past. And that's uh, part of the theme for uh, this broader project of which this talk is a part. Um, I start with the observation of China's uh, alienation from the international system. And I think a very good example of that, although certainly not the only example is uh, uh, President Xi Jinping's uh, speech at the uh, 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China, in which he said we will never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress, or subjugate us. And I think what we see here is a level of alienation from the international system. And that sort of contrasts with my two previous books, uh, 1 214, in which I use the dynamic of selective adaptation to explain how China internalizes international treaty obligations. And my most recent book that uh, Padwin mentioned, uh, which came out this past January on China's uh, human rights activism internationally, in which China is very active in trying to uh, adjust or change the international norms and processes for human rights to suit its uh, policy objectives. So, uh, but it seems to me that in contrast to both of those, which in, in involve a high level of interaction with the system, uh, what we're seeing more recently is just a sense of alienation from the system and an attempt to go uh, in a, perhaps a more independent direction. And, uh, and this affects China's responses on both the COVID file and the climate change file. So if we look at China's COVID response, uh, 
there are some important contexts for that. Uh, that uh, one that I refer to as modernization and colonialism, where we see the tension uh, underlying a lot of China's uh, um, health and medicine policies between so-called Western medicine and Chinese traditional medicine. And Chinese traditional medicine has, of course, a rich uh, tradition in China, and uh, and so the question of how to integrate those two has uh, affected Chinese uh, health policy, PRC health policy, for quite some time. Uh, historically, we've of course seen the introduction of Western medicine into China in the 19th century uh, with missionaries and so on, and uh, perhaps uh, in late 19th and early 20th century training of Chinese doctors in uh, Western medicine through the Yale and China program and others. So we've seen that tension between China's uh, domestic, historical, and indigenous uh, uh, approaches to medicine and uh, its adaptation to Western medicine. Now, in the most recent uh, World Health Organization uh, 13th General Program of Work, what we're seeing is uh, a, a fairly intense effort to ensure that developing countries, and China is particularly in this category, providing better data access in order to allow for uh, health policy improvements that are in uh, uh, conformity with the Millennium Development Goals. So in some ways, the w WHO's uh, most recent general program of work uh, speaks to the question of uh, um, uh, creating more space for Western medicine and in some senses, a, uh, a kind of a colonialist approach to imposing on China standards for data access and so on. China's relationship with the WHO has combined this dynamic of alienation with efforts to build influence. So when we look at China's position as a donor to the WTO, uh, it's ranked 15th among WHO donors just above Canada, uh, but it, it pales in comparison to uh, the donations from the US, the UK, Germany, and Japan, and, uh, and particularly in light of China having the second largest economy in the world, that has certainly had an, an impact on China's influence in the WT WHO. However, China has also, excuse me, had an impact on uh, WHO leadership, being a, uh, a champion of the uh, leadership of Margaret Chan, 2006 to 2017, and a, uh, an important supporter of uh, Tedros uh, Ghebreyesus, uh, who is the current uh, director. So China has uh, really tried to make up for its absence of uh, funding donations with uh, uh, support for leadership in the WT WHO. Uh, China's relationship with the WHO is also comp uh, complicated by China's experience with both the HIV crisis in 95-203, and it received praise from the, uh, from the WHO in 2005 for its uh, transparency and its efforts. But then again, in the SARS outbreak of 2002-2003, there was significant WHO criticism of China's uh, performance. So there are tensions over China's experience with prior outbreaks with uh, WHO leadership and relations with WHO uh, donors. Now, when we look at China's uh, pandemic response, um, I have uh, thought about it in terms of a series of layered themes. These are not strictly speaking uh, sequential, uh, but rather are layered. And the first uh, theme is one of containment and control. And so we saw, of course, in January 1st, the Huanan food market in Wuhan closed down. We saw a general lockdown in Wuhan in January 23rd of uh, 2020. And then even today, continuing of a zero COVID uh, policy, which is really an effort to ensure that no COVID cases break out. And the result of that is a fairly locked down approach. There's also an approach of information suppression, and we've seen the dilemma of local officials who are whose careers are often at stake uh, if too much information or not the right kind of information about their performance is made publicly available. So there's a dilemma for them. Uh, there's also the official media, which takes instruction from the regime, and it has uh, been discouraged from in, uh, uh, widespread information. Uh, uh, especially in the early stages. We saw doctors uh, being criticized for publicizing the, uh, uh, or for sending emails to colleagues about the, uh, about the outbreak and the case of Li Wenliang is probably the most well-known, but there are many others. We've also seen a repression of citizen reporters such as Zhang Zhan, who is now on a hunger strike and in very difficult shape in her condition of detention, and Li Zihua, who have been uh, suppressed by the regime for putting out information on conditions in, uh, in, uh, in Wuhan. And of course, we've seen establishment commentators, Ren Zhichang, uh, Xu Zhangrun, and Xu Zhiyong, uh, also being criticized and in, in some cases detained and so on for their unrehearsed or certainly unapproved uh, comments about the, uh, about the, the uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, 
Um, one very emblematic document of the, uh, uh, of the, do of the phase or, or the theme of containment and control is the Ministry of Justice's law enforcement opinion uh, issued in February 2020, which had to do with strengthening political and party oversight over law enforcement relating to the pandemic. Uh, it increased severity and consistency in enforcing pandemic lockdowns and mandates, and it really served as a vehicle for bureaucratic as well as political guidance. And I'm just gonna walk through it a little bit and give you a couple of highlights. Uh, the first point in the opinion is to raise the position of politics uh, through political guidance in law enforcement. And this takes a page from the fourth plenum of the 18th CPC Congress on law serving uh, the uh, direction of the party. Um, strict law enforcement uh, is also about upholding regime lockdowns and, uh, and information control, uh, reflecting a 2018 speech by Xi Jinping at the Central Commission on comprehensively ruling the country according to law. We also see efforts at standardization, uh, fairness, and civilized law enforcement, which are intended to make law enforcement less inconsistent, uh, less unfair, uh, to people because the important thing is not to uh, affect public opinion about the pandemic. And so that, and those draw on a number of Xi Jinping speeches. We see an effort to emphasize innovative law enforcement methods, uh, which draws on a 2021, 2025 uh, CPC State Council provisional outline on lawful governance um, that uh, touches on many of those issues. Uh, the coordination of law enforcement uh, the, um, is also about empowering agencies at the next highest level to see cooperation among their subordinate offices. And this uh, uh, falls with a administrative law enforcement coordination and supervision bureau in the Ministry of Justice. Uh, third, uh, or eighth rather, uh, strengthening law enforcement supervision, which is about strengthening interagency cooperation, managing administrative law enforcement, and curbing, quote, illegal law enforcement activities. One of the dilemmas that the regime has is that there is abuse of power by local police, and that is a widespread phenomenon, and many people in China complain about it. But at the same time, the regime needs uh, law and order, so to speak, uh, social uh, stability um, to ensure its own authority and its own ability to carry out its policy goals. So it's got a, a tension between empowering the police to uh, enforce uh, COVID restrictions, but at the same time, ensuring that that, uh, that empowerment is not abused. Uh, elect next is an effort to uh, have strict responsibilities, a responsibility system for law enforcement, which uh, if we look at the uh, State Council's COVID white paper, which we'll do in a moment or so, uh, law enforcement is really aimed at maintaining social order and stability in the context of uh, COVID. And finally, raising law enforcement safeguards, which include providing PPE and so on for law enforcement personnel. So that, uh, that opinion by the, uh, by the Ministry of Justice issued in February 2020 is a very good expression of this initial phase, which continued, but it's a kind of a layering thing, of, uh, of control and, uh, and, and uh, containment. Uh, a second uh, theme is uh, a theme of partial disclosure and cooperation. As you'll see from the dates, they sort of overlap with the, with the uh, containment and control theme. But in here, we see the Politburo Standing Committee in January 7th, which really um, called for political leadership and activism in, uh, in, in confronting the COVID challenge. Uh, January 9th, we see the WHO, with China's permission, announcing China's pre preliminary determination on the novel coronavirus. Uh, January 10th and 11th, uh, China began providing genetic sequencing uh, to the world, to others, and including the United States. Uh, January 20th, we see the Chinese Center for Disease Control uh, uh, affirming uh, that COVID is, uh, involves human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, the next day, the uh, front page editorial in the, in the People's Daily, the Renminer Bao, uh, noted uh, China's all-out effort to contain the uh, virus and the appointment of a leading small group uh, of uh, uh, Lingdao Xiaozu under uh, Li Keqiang. And then finally, on January 28th, uh, President Xi Jinping meets with uh, WHO Director Tedros to uh, discuss cooperation in responding to the uh, to the uh, outbreak. And uh, in February, we have a, a WHO joint mission report, which concluded that the origins of the virus involved zoonotic transfer, which is transfer from 
uh, animals in the wet market in Wuhan to humans. Uh, the report had praise for China's transparency and cooperation, but there was also criticism by quite a number of observers at, about the lack of transparency and questions about the conclusions on the origins of the virus. And so a second mission was planned for early 2021, and, uh, and that mission uh, had its, uh, we'll, we'll sp speak to in a moment. In June 2020, uh, the State Council Information Office issued a white paper on China's COVID uh, uh, struggle. And this is really aimed at an international audience and I think uh, contrasts with the Ministry of Justice opinion I spoke to a few minutes ago, uh, which was really about uh, containment and control. And this one is really about uh, cooperation and greater uh, responsiveness. So I'll just go through that one a little bit. Uh, with some comments. Um, China, the white paper talks about an open, transparent, and responsible manner in accordance with law that informed China's notification of the international community. But uh, there have been quite a lot of well-documented uh, uh, conclusions that the transparency was not quite as fulsome as might be expected. And when we talk about transparency and information disclosure in accordance with law, the important thing to remember is that China's laws on transparency and on information uh, disclosure impose significant restrictions. Uh, against unauthorized disclosure of information. So the notion of transparency and information disclosure, it, according to law, should be looked at in the context of China, Chinese laws, restrictions on those sorts of things. Uh, the white paper goes on to talk about the party and the government uh, addressing the epidemic as a top priority and that Ge uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping has taken personal command. Um, many respected observers, including uh, Xu Zhiyong and Xu Zhangrun, who I mentioned earlier, have suggested that the party and she have actually compounded the challenges. So it's a debated issue, I think it's fair to say. Um, China has provided information on COVID in a thoroughly uh, professional and efficient way. But again, that has been criticized by multiple observers, including the WTO, WHO rather, sorry. Now, section two of the white paper presents several timetables on China's efforts to control the pandemic. And make no mistake, China made serious and long ranging efforts to control the pandemic. Uh, but the white paper's timetables uh, begin on December 27th to 19 and avoids very uh, numerous and sensitive questions about the regime's conduct during the initial discovery and response. Um, China's, uh, the white paper refers to China's ability to mobilize uh, resources uh, to accomplish uh, national incentives and so on. And part of this is about a, uh, um, the, the notion that an authoritarian government is more effective in controlling these kinds of crises. And that matter, as you may appreciate, is uh, quite hotly debated. Um, there's also a uh, reference to uh, President Xi's speech of the World Health Assembly, which is the administrative home of the WHO, uh, to strengthen global governance. But this, of course, echoes a recurring PRC theme aimed at diluting the rule-based international order and endorsing China's governance practices. It's also important to note that the comment uh, referring to Xi Jinping talks about economic and social development, and that adds a reference to the right to development discourse, which places development equally alongside other human rights, such as freedom of expression, um, in the uh, efforts uh, that the Chinese government has pursue, uh, pursued and thus allows development to be a, uh, a primary uh, objective. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the uh, white paper closes by uh, calling for resisting scapegoating and other self-serving artifices and so on, which challenges calls for further investigation into China's responsibility for the emergence of the coronavirus. And I think that white paper really uh, uh, encapsulates uh, China's uh, combination of uh, limited information disclosure and uh, limited cooperation internationally. Then uh, after uh, another, uh, another theme is, is really limiting uh, China's international uh, engagement. And this really happened after the, uh, as I mentioned, the 2021 mission of January and February. Uh, which concluded that the laboratory origin of the pandemic is considered to be extremely unlikely. However, there was much observer criticism with respect to data access, transparency, and uh, omission of the possibility of a lab leak. In that report, it was uh, much criticized and, uh, and quite controversial. In May, the U.S. started an investigation, uh, provided a report initially on, uh, in August and an update in October, and it was inconclusive on whether zoonotic transfer or lab leak was the cause. Uh, China's response was uh, unremittingly hostile and uh, suggested that other countries might be responsible for the origins of the coronavirus, including the US. 
In July, uh, Director Tedros uh, walked back the conclusions of the 2021 mission and said that the conclusions discounting the possible lab origins of the virus were premature, and he proposed a further investigation, which China, excuse me, rejected as political and not based on science. And since then, we've had continued resistance to data access, lab audits, and case files. We've seen uh, references to state sovereignty and patient confidentiality as explanations for not doing those sorts of things. We've seen a lot of criticism of the United States and the EU on, uh, on the origins tracing question. We've seen China continuing to champion the superiority of its authoritarian governance in responding to COVID. And finally, uh, or in next, uh, a very vigorous effort at vaccine diplomacy where China's vaccines are being distributed around the world to developing economies. It's also tried to prod the WHO and the WHA to focus on control of the virus, not on its origins and resisting new investigations. It's worth noting in all of this that China was not ranked in the Johns Hopkins uh, Global COVID Performance Index uh, due to a lack of data, while Taiwan was actually ranked third uh, on its performance. So, so what we see in China's COVID response is a combination of initial containment and control, uh, gradual uh, delivery of information and a modest cooperation, and then a bit of a withdrawal from that cooperation in more recent times. And I think this reflects the uh, evolving conditions of China's alienation from uh, the international system. Uh, turning to climate change, uh, some, some similar, uh, um, similar um, contexts. Um, climate change is, is, is seen in China as part of its development priorities, and we see the 2021 uh, Nationally Determined Contributions Report, the NDC, in anticipation of the, of the, uh, of the Glasgow uh, meeting, which uh, said that China's uh, climate response must take into account food and energy security, which of course integrates climate change with China's developmental policies. Um, there's also been tensions with the international climate establishment, both FC, uh, the um, framework convention on climate change and the agreements that have come out of that, Kyoto and Copenhagen, and we'll get to those in a moment. And, and I, again, think of layered themes of resistance, local action and international cooperation. So on the matter of resistance, we've seen primarily an effort to build solidarity with developing economies. So in 1993, uh, China ratified the Framework Convention on Climate uh, Change, but emphasized the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And this, uh, this uh, qualifier was reiterated in the Kyoto uh, Protocol and China's response to it. It was reiterated in China's behavior at the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit. Uh, it was stated in the 2011 white paper and again in the 2019 report from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, and finally at the 2021 Glasgow meetings. So that solidarity with developing uh, economies is part of China's resistance to a, uh, a more established developing country approach to climate uh, change. Um, so uh, in addition to the resistance dimension, there's also quite a lot of local action in China. And, and the one example is the 2011 white paper on climate, uh, which says that China is the world's largest developing country. So that developing country nexus is made quite clear very early on in that white paper. Uh, it also talks about uh, climate change creating negative effects on China's economic and social development, uh, presenting climate change as one of many factors that are part of China's economic and social development program. Uh, the Chinese government sets store on the issue of China, climate change. And again, long-term planning for economic and social development includes climate change as a major issue, but certainly not the only issue. Uh, China has adopted a range of major policy measures uh, that are outlined here and to establish a policy orientation of promoting green development and setting out objectives uh, for climate change for the next five years, but then subsequently as well in many five-year plans. So one of the questions becomes, how is the climate change theme or policy integrated with China's economic and social development? Because of course, uh, economic prosperity is a key objective of the regime and a key basis for its legitimacy. So that tension uh, between climate change at, uh, measures and economic development and social development measures is uh, outlined in this document. Uh, there's discussion of China's constructive role in international negotiations and uh, explicit reference to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and the, the, the assertion that development countries 
developed countries rather should be responsible for their accumulated emissions during the 200 odd years of industrialization, which is the main reason for global warming. So this uh, argument we've heard many times, but that principle of common but differentiated responsibilities is first and foremost in China's policy orientation toward international obligations on climate change. Now, in addition to the white paper, which sort of sets forth largely for an international audience, but uh, China's uh, uh, climate policy, we've seen a lot of domestic activity, uh, a, a, a very uh, active efforts to uh, get a handle on air pollution. So air pollution law and regulation, uh, last law was revised in 215, uh, action plans in 213 and 218. And I think the general consensus is that although there are still issues and with severe health effects, um, the, uh, the, the, the air pollution issue is being addressed quite uh, frontally by the regime. Now in 2019, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment issued a uh, document on China's policies and actions for addressing climate change, which basically captures the title of the 2011 white paper. But uh, the, the MEE document is quite revealing in many ways. Uh, China has always attached great importance to addressing climate change. But here we have a quote from Professor, uh, from President Xi Jinping, where he has emphasized many times that addressing climate change should not be done at others' requests, but at our own initiative. Uh, and we will promote international cooperation on climate change on the basis of principles of common but differentiated responsibilities, equity, and respective capabilities. So all of that comes back uh, into our vision when we look at China's international cooperation on this, but, um, but those provide a very important context in the domestic context of its ministry on uh, China's policies and actions. Now, another dimension of this is the institutional framework. So the National Climate Change Office was located in the National uh, Development and Reform Commission, uh, NDFC Fagaiwei, uh, in 1998. Uh, the Ministry of Environmental Protection uh, was named that in, in, uh, in 2008, li lifted to ministerial status, although the Environmental Protection Bureau had been in existence before that. Um, and in 2018, the NDRC climate change file was moved over to uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, which replaced the Ministry of Environmental Protection. So MEE has now got the climate change file as of 2018, but uh, NDRC is still very active. And so in April two, uh, 2021, the uh, NDRC, uh, in October rather, issued a, um, a uh, created a, a climate leading small group within the NDRC and issued a peaking action plan and a working guidance on carbon, carbon neutrality, showing that it was no longer um, uh, bystand or a bystander to the M uh, to the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. And as I skipped this, but in April of 2021, uh, the Politburo Standing Committee issued instructions on carbon peaking and carbon neutrality, because those are two uh, key commitments that China has is involved with uh, coming out of the Paris Agreement. And so what this shows is there is a multiplicity of agencies involved. We have the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, we have the uh, party Politburo, and we have the NDRC, and that invites contending agendas and bureaucratic politics, which give us uh, some sense of where some of the debates within China will be over the next little while. Now, China has also, uh, in addition to the uh, themes I just mentioned, of, of uh, uh, the themes that I <laughs> just uh, mentioned of local action, as well as resistance, we see a certain level of international uh, collaboration. So, uh, but from the 2011 white paper to the 2019 Ministry of Ecology and Environment report, the notion of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities continues to be the dominant theme in China's policy architecture for climate change. Uh, we also saw China providing national communications on, China, on climate change, for the uh, framework convention process in 2004, 2012, and 2018. And in preparation um, uh, for the Paris uh, COP21 meeting in 2015, uh, China's a signatory and accepted the goals, the Paris goals, to quote, limit climate, uh, limit global temperature increases to well below two degrees Celsius while pursuing efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the Paris uh, Climate Accords uh, um, also created an opportunity for China to assert prominence in the climate file after the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement. China's also issued two uh, uh, nationally determined contributions 
uh, documents, one for the Paris meeting and one for the recent Glasgow meeting, which talk about China's efforts at climate change, some of which I've mentioned in the context of domestic efforts, but also reiterate the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities uh, discourse. In April 2021, we had a leaders climate summit in Washington that revisited Paris warming targets and uh, looked at uh, and China uh, asserted a, a commitment to 2030 for carbon peaking and 2060 for carbon neutrality. Uh, this was reiterated in President Xi's uh, speech to the UN General Assembly in September, uh, again, uh, emphasizing the 2030, 2060 timelines and also committing to ending investment in coal fired power plants in developing countries, which uh, has particular implications for China's Belt and Road Initiative. Then the uh, at, at the COP26 that has just been completed, Excuse me, and I hasten to add, this is a work in progress, so we haven't gotten the full readout on, on COP26 yet, but uh, here are a few thoughts on it. Um, uh, Xi Jinping, as many know, did not appear personally, but issued a letter, and in that letter, he emphasized the NDRC's uh, climate plan and climate guidance, a plan on peaking and guidance on, on neutrality, uh, and reiterated the 230 uh, goal for peaking, uh, talked about 260 as the goal for carbon neutrality, not 2050. Um, and also at Glasgow, uh, China resisted revisions. Uh, Xie Zhenhua, the Chinese chief delegate uh, with a long history on climate and environmental matters in China, um, uh, was uh, uh, resistant to the notion of revisiting the parish temperature targets from well below two degrees and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius to a firm 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, um, a commitment. And that was resisted. China did not sign on to the methane pledge uh, that had been signed by many uh, over 100 countries around the world. Uh, China's uh, did not sign the coal pledge, which was intended to uh, uh, unify um, uh, the, the, the elimination essentially of coal. But in the final uh, document, uh, China's last minute intervention ensured that the term phase out, which was used to phase out um, uh, coal and other uh, hydrocarbon energy to phasing it down. And China did this in, uh, in concert with India, but that showed its continued resistance to the notion of restrictions on its own energy supplies and reminds us that energy security was a particular condition for China's climate activity. On the finance side, uh, China has supported uh, the creation of a facility to deal with loss and damage, which is the, essentially the compensation to developing economies for the harm that climate has caused to them as a result of the industrial uh, uh, activities of developed economies. Um, but uh, the developed economies are preferring the term dialogue. And so that facility versus dialogue is a key issue on enforcement. Uh, China also supported clean energy uh, uh, subsidies for poor countries and also uh, adaptation support. And one of the issues is that the commitments of developed countries in these areas have not really been met. There were uh, major commitments made at Paris that have not yet been met. And so that has been a big issue for China and for others at the Glasgow meetings. Now, one of the key issues on China is, of course, relations with the United States and China's climate change. Uh, the US Paris uh, withdrawal and rejoining was a key dynamic in China's relationship to the international climate community. Uh, the US issued a fact sheet on China's climate uh, performance in 2020, and China was uh, not, uh, did not receive it uh, well and was very critical of the US withdrawal from Paris and the US policies. Then in Shanghai in April of this year, uh, uh, Envoy uh, John Kerry and uh, Chinese Minister Xie Zhenhua uh, had a, a joint statement in which they committed to cooperation. Uh, they anticipated the leader summit that was held later that month, and they committed to continuing to discuss a whole variety of, of climate related policies. Uh, we had the Leaders Summit, of course, that I mentioned before in, in Washington, and that also uh, gave an opportunity for China and the United States to try to find ways to cooperate on climate, despite the many other issues that are troublesome in the relationship. And this is one of the dilemmas so that we see in September this year, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi essentially uh, said to uh, Ambassador Kerry and to others that China's cooperation with the U.S. on climate could not proceed effectively unless some of the other issues, notably Taiwan, but also uh, human rights and sanctions on Xinjiang uh, were dealt with. Uh, efforts to have a, another joint statement in Tianjin in September did not succeed. So going into the climate summit, it, uh, it was uh, things were 
uncertain as to whether China and the United States would be able to put aside their differences in order to cooperate on a matter of global concern and of their own national interests. Uh, we see a bit more of this at the G20 uh, in October where China continued to resist uh, efforts by the US and others to get them to commit to different dates, different temperature requirements and different activities on climate. Then, and, and uh, this was uh, treated as a, as a surprise uh, to many, um, but there was the joint Glasgow declaration again uh, with Ambassador Kerry and Minister Xie Zhenhua uh, on November 10th uh, of this year. And what's really very interesting is that the language of the Glasgow declaration, when we compare it to the April joint declaration, the April joint declaration really emphasized continuing to discuss various matters on climate policy, whereas the uh, Glasgow de uh, Declaration was more specific and articulated an intent to cooperate on a variety of matters uh, listed below, uh, bilateral climate action in the 20s, uh, cooperation on regulatory frameworks, maximizing societal benefits, encouraging decarbonization, promoting green design, and deployment and application of carbon capture. And, uh, and this and the uh, Glasgow Declaration also committed the parties to establishing a working group, which will facilitate ongoing uh, communication and cooperation. One of the questions, of course, that has to be asked is the effects of personalized diplomacy. So clearly, Ambassador Kerry and Minister Sia have a relationship going back for many uh, for quite some time, and uh, and and this uh, uh, declaration seems to follow on to their April joint statement and uh, and suggests that the personalized diplomacy here made a big difference. But one of the questions is going to be, what about the bureaucracies back home? Are they going to embrace these agreements with the same vigor? So uh, this uh, next slide is really about uh, comparing uh, China's uh, COP26 commitments with those of the US, the UK, Germany, and the EU, which really represent the, um, the establishment core of the international climate community and the Glasgow meeting. And, and so we see uh, the temperature goal, a firm commitment to uh, 1.5 Celsius, where China uh, is still committing to the Paris targets, which are a bit more flexible and its policies as many have indicated, suggest actually that they will lead us to a three degree in increase. On the net zero emissions date, we see the US and the UK at 2050. We see the EU at 2050. We see Germany actually at 2045. China has declined to move its 2060 uh, date earlier. On uh, the methane pledge, uh, the EU and the US were co-sponsors, and uh, but China declined to, uh, to, uh, to join that. Uh, the coal pledge, um, in, in contrast to the US, the UK, Germany, and the EU, China was a non-signatory, but it pledged to peak coal use by 2025 and pledged an ending uh, of investment in international coal power. And I noted before the language uh, of phasing out and phasing down. And on the last in, loss and damage facility, again, China prefers a loss and damage facility, whereas the others uh, uh, prefer a dialogue, which obviously is more flexible and, and potentially less effective. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is to go lastly to conclusions. Uh, the alienation affects China's engagement with the world system, and we've seen that on the pandemic and on climate. And so our challenge is re-engagement with China because neither one of these issues, pandemic or climate, or the other ones I'm dealing with in this, in this project, can be dealt with effectively without China. So it seems to me that re-engagement is essential, but what kind of re-engagement? And I would suggest it involves situational incentive-based responses. So my recommendations in the last minute uh, are to lead by example, strengthen our capacity for persuasion on COVID and climate, which means strengthening our domestic COVID response and our international assistance. And it means meeting or exceeding the Paris, Paris Glasgow standards so that when we are encouraging China to uh, uh, revise some of its COVID policies or its climate policies or strengthen its performance, um, we are speaking from it leading by example. Uh, the transition from relational to situational, uh, the term selective engagement is often used, which is to focus on the mutual interest in COVID and climate rather than the whole of relationship. And I've made this point in Canada kind of repeatedly, and I would suggest that we are in a stage now with China where a situational approach is more effective and more important than a relational one creating communities of like-minded countries to coordinate action to encourage China's constructive participation in international systems on pandemic and climate change. It's not alliances against China, it's alliances or uh, communities of like-minded countries that can coordinate activity. 
I think uh, leverage is an important element of this, and it's important to res respond to China's need for acceptance and status and respect in the international community. And this can be conditioned on performance. For the last 30 years or so, I would say that the uh, acceptance, status, and respect uh, offered China has not been conditioned so much on performance, but perhaps now is the time to think about that, and including discouraging expansive sovereignty claims. As I mentioned before, China has used sovereignty as a, as a reason for uh, its uh, tempered performance of both WHO agreements and the uh, framework convention requirements. Now there's some se uh, excuse me, se sector specific matters. On COVID, uh, a transition from origin tracing to preventative measures, and I was delighted to see that made that comment made in the, uh, in the uh, video uh, conference between President Biden and President Xi this week. Uh, and we can draw on uh, uh, PRC biosafety and food safety regimes to support preventative measures on both lab leaks and zoonotic transfers. Uh, we want to encourage collaborative monitoring as per the US bioengagement program. And on climate, we uh, can consider linking funding support, whether through the COPE uh, Climate Finance Delivery Plan or China's Clean Development Mechanism to climate performance. And finally, it's worth thinking about integrating climate performance with business relations, uh, using uh, uh, framework convention performance benchmarks in trade and investment liberalization and calling on private firms to include uh, climate standards in their business agreements and activities. And recall that under the Article 20 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the general exceptions, there are exceptions for protecting human, animal, plant life, and health. And all of those are implicated in both COVID and, uh, and climate, but particularly climate. So thank you very much. And I'm delighted to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Potter, for the detailed and informative presentation. So we have a few questions for you from the audience. And the first question has to do with China's response to COVID-19. And the question is, the Chinese government reportedly improved its uh, epidemic response procedures after the SARS. Were these changes inadequate or just disregarded in the case of COVID-19? Uh, when we uh, look at China's response to SARS, uh, they enacted quite a number of regulatory measures and policy measures aimed at, uh, at making their response to widespread uh, epidemic outbreaks uh, more effective. And in some ways, uh, their response to COVID was more effective. Uh, their their uh, containment and control uh, uh, theme, if you will, as indicated in that MOJ opinion, but in other documents as well, and statements by leaders, uh, has been relatively effective. So the question of controlling uh, uh, COVID uh, in, in some ways reflects their experience with SARS. But at the same time, as we know in a global community, um, information access, data access, lab audits, and so on are critically important to assuring the international community that things are in hand and informing China's own people about things being in hand. And in those areas, there has not been as much progress. Got it, thank you for the response. The next question focuses on US and China cooperation. So the question is, what, if anything, is the United States government doing to have constructive engagement and cooperation with China on major global issues you have identified? Well, I think the, uh, the comments on, uh, uh, on um, at, at, at the COP26, the US-China uh, agreement, and the way that that agreement moved from focusing on discussions to commitments to cooperate and a number of very specific things indicated really quite decisively actually that that the US and China and the US in particular are but China too are prepared to put aside differences in order to cooperate on things of mutual interest but at the same time those differences of uh, those differences are about real things i mean taiwan is a real issue the repression of the uyghurs in xinjiang is a real issue the uh, number of uh, treatment of Hong Kong and many other issues. So, so I don't think the U.S. is willing to set those aside. And China seems increasingly, albeit reluctantly, uh, amenable to having a climate discussion, at least, that does not is not distracted by those kinds of issues. So I would say that those are important. But what's also important is the, uh, the summit uh, this week or the video uh, meeting between President Xi and uh, President Biden, which really, I think the fact that it happened at all and the fact that it showed 
at the very leadership level, a, a commitment to try to cooperate on things of mutual interest, even while acknowledging that there are differences between our two countries and those are gonna play out as they will. So, you know, I think the, uh, the issue really here is now about restoring a process for what I call situational engagement, which is engagement on issues of mutual interest while reserving the uh, capacity to respond on issues uh, there where we disagree. Okay, all right. Next question is, what can we expect in the case of another pandemic involving China? What might China do differently? Thank you for that. And um, of course, the, uh, if we look at the past 20 years, we see uh, novel coronaviruses emerging with some regularity. And part of that has to do with humanity's encroachment on the natural world. Um, and it's not all about China because some of them have come elsewhere from elsewhere, but China is a, is, is a source of several. And, and so one of the real issues here is transparency and openness. And that comes into the whole question of the Western medicine and Chinese medicine it has to do with sovereignty questions and so on. Um, and, and so I think that a, an accommodation which allows for sharing of information. And one of the things I've always uh, uh, suggested is that uh, our actions in China on policy matters ought to enhance China's own policy commitments. So with respect to the, the, the US investigation and the WTO, investigations and the criticisms and observe observations of many specialists have basically not been able to resolve the question of whether it was a lab leak or whether it was zoonotic transfer. So it doesn't actually, from my perspective, I think we ought to stop worrying about which one it is and just say, let's adopt preventative measures for both. Now on the zoonotic transfer, China has a very well-established food safety law. And so working with its food safety regime efforts can be made to improve those circumstances and reduce the possibility of zoonotic transfer. Uh, similarly, um, with respect to the, uh, to the lab leak question, uh, China has an established regime for biosafety and lab safety, and the US uh, bio cooperation agreement is a very good opportunity to share information. So that the, the key is to move away from the idea of trying to trace blame and rather focus on how do we prevent things from happening in the future? And I think uh, responding to the possibilities of zoonotic transfer and lab leaks is, is the place to start and doing it in a cooperation, cooperative way is a good way to move forward. And frankly, I think we saw uh, echoes of that in the uh, Biden uh, Xi uh, video uh, summit this week. That's great, thank you. The next question is, how much of international criticism of China's pandemic response is fair, in your opinion? Well, uh, I would have to say, as a person who's had many books uh, criticized and many speeches criticized, I say all criticism is unfair. But, um, uh, but criticism is part of the process. And, 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 and we all ought to be in a situation where we can accept comments and suggestions from others as a way of improving our own performance. And whether it's criticism of, of the US COVID response, whether it's criticism of frankly, Canada's climate response, which is a particularly big issue, or criticism of China, I think all of that is part of a discourse in which moving toward uh, resolution and better understanding is really at the root of it. So, so you know, I, I think it's important that we recognize that, that uh, criticism can be carried out for political reasons, but you know everything's political, so that just kind of goes with the territory. So I think all of us ought to be, uh, both China and, and China's friends around the world, we ought to adopt a policy of being less thin-skinned and more sensitive, uh, more sensitive to others and less thin-skinned about what others say about us. Got it. Okay, next question. How should US and the international community respond when China does not follow through with what it promises? Uh, thank you for that. Um, it's important in this regard to look at the comment uh, that was reiterated in the MEE 2019 summary of China's climate responses and the quote uh, repeatedly apparently from, uh, from President Xi that China does these things not because they're being requested by others, but because they're doing it for their own purposes. Well, treaty compliance is not a request. 
when when China signs on to the Paris Agreement or other agreements such as the Law of the Sea, such as elimination of racial discrimination, such as bilateral consular agreements, these are treaty commitments. These are not re respectful requests from someone else that China, if it feels like it, will do something. They're about treaty performance. And so I would just suggest that when we look at China's relationship with the international community, and I would say the same should apply to the US, the same should apply to Canada and other countries, what we're talking about is compliance with treaties. Because once a country signs a treaty, by definition, it is, it is uh, uh, diminishing its sovereignty claims. That's what treaties are. Treaties are states saying, I will give up my sovereignty on this issue because it's in my interest to do so. So I really think that the question of cooperation with the international community is not about outsiders' requests. It's not about doing favors for people. It's not about whether we woulda, coulda, shoulda. It is about complying with binding treaty obligations. And I think if we keep it at that level, which is really about international law, the entire community benefits because international law is intended to apply to everyone. Okay, got it. Thank you for the response. Okay, moving on to the next question. What are the realistic prospects for China becoming less thin-skinned, as you said, given the unique domestic political situation of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, you know, one of the uh, things that I am grappling with in my current work and which I tried to address in some detail in the Exporting Virtue book that came out this past January is, uh, is the question of why does China care? Why does China actually care what the international community thinks? Because China is the second largest economy in the world and a powerful global force. But the reality is that the legitimacy of the Chinese government does depend now increasingly on performance. And that performance has to do with prosperity and economic well being for its people. It also uh, depends on its ability to uh, effectuate its policies internationally. And so that performance really does um, depend on Chinese actions. But at the same time, because it is so critically tied up with the legitimation um, uh, dynamic, China is particularly sensitive to challenges to its behavior, which can affect its legitimacy at home. And, and I think that is a, uh, that is just, um, I think it's uh, unavoidable. But so the way I think we can respond to that is by remember emphasizing inclusion, consultation, respect for China. But at the same time, I think it's a showing of respect to hold each other to high standards of performance. That to me is a sign of respect. If we say to a country, well, you signed this treaty, but you really don't have to follow it because we know you're a developing country and you got problems. That to me is disrespectful. That is diminishing their standing. I think it is much more respectful to say, we have agreements and we need to follow them. So um, I, I think that as China builds more confidence, as the regime builds more confidence in its performance, and at the end of the day, it's not about ideology, it's not about history, it's really about its performance. And as the regime performs better, assures prosperity more effectively, and becomes more confident in its uh, legitimacy, I hope the thin skin problem will go away. Okay. Might not okay. happen tomorrow. Okay. Okay, next question. China does need a role model, but who is going to lead by example? In terms of climate change, major powers, including the US, Canada, and Australia, all have failed to lead. How can we persuade China that it should follow the best practice when others don't? Well, thank you very much for that. And I alluded to that in my policy recommendations section of my talk, which is that uh, the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, others need to lead by example. There is absolutely no point in saying to China, you have to change your uh, carbon neutrality date from 2060 to 2050 in order to comply with Glasgow and Paris when we ourselves are having trouble meeting those dates. And I would say that uh, the US actually climate record is relatively good, but uh, I mean, it needs to be improved and so on, of course, but, but Canada's uh, record is really problematic. I mean, it's largely due to the tar sands, but, but there are issues with the ability to lead by example when your own house is not in order. So I really think that what Glasgow provides, not only in the US-China joint declaration, but in the agreement as a whole, is it provides a series of benchmarks and commitments 
moving into the next year or the next two years, the next five years, which countries can embrace and really make the decisions, hard decisions, because they have to do with economic interests, but make those hard decisions that allow us to make genuine progress on climate. And when we do that, we can then set examples for others. It, it is, I think, quite difficult right now for uh, much of the West to be, uh, and I said, I, I, I actually said in an off-color remark to a colleague the other day that what, what Glasgow looked like to me is an effort by the developed countries to try to persuade developing economies like China and India to do more. And, uh, and you know, that is a difficult, that's a hard road to hoe because the developed economies, the industrialized economies, frankly, are responsible for the vast majority of historical emissions. But at the same time, China is, depending on how you count it, the largest or second largest emitter. They have, India is a very major emitter. And, and those things need to be dealt with, even if there are historical complications. And one of the ways to do that is through the climate uh, financing arrangements that are talked about in Glasgow and which need to go much farther in order to create incentives for developing economies and particularly China and India to um, get their emissions under control. But we can't move that way unless we are prepared in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere to really set an example with our own behavior. Okay, got it. Um, we have about four minutes left. So um, I think it's gonna be one last question. To re-engage China, is it possible to and necessary to separate China's justifiable claims and policies from unjustifiable assertions and claims? Well, yes, short answer is yes. But uh, the long answer is, this touches on the kind of situational engagement that I've suggested is a useful way to approach China. So, so there are China uh, um, questions about the international system and about the behavior of uh, some of its uh, friends and partners in the world. And some of those are legitimate questions. Some of them are less legitimate, less compelling. But we can't make a broad judgment on that just here, what we need to do is engage in a situational set of relationships where when we're talking about maritime transport, when we're talking about, again, climate or COVID, when we're talking about refugee migration, when we're talking about uh, autonomy of uh, places like Hong Kong or Taiwan or other places, um, those are areas where we can start to sort out where China's what, what China's claims actually are and, and where they are legitimate and robust and deserve respect and where they are uh, harder to engage with. And I think we need to do that on a situational basis. Okay, got it. We have about two minutes left and I would like to squeeze in one more question. Um, Danny, do we have any more questions coming in? No, okay, all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter, for sharing your fascinating work. And your talk has really enhanced our understanding of China's stance on COVID-19 and climate change. And I also would like to extend our big thanks to our online audience for joining us this afternoon. And we'd like to invite everybody to our next EWC Insights on December 15th for a talk by Laura Salman. And until then, have a great rest of, rest of the day, everyone. Goodbye. Uh, thank you so much, and it's been my pleasure to be here.